the Henry M. Jackson School of International Studies at the University of Washington presents World Focus, a continuing series on international political, social, economic, and cultural issues. Martin Jaffe. I'm this year acting chair of the uh, Jewish Studies program at the University of Washington, and it's my pleasure uh, to introduce uh, the 1988-89 uh, lectures sponsored by Samuel and Althea Strom in Jewish Studies. Uh, this year's lecture was Michael A. Meyer of Hebrew Union College, professor of modern Jewish history. Uh, his lectures were entitled Jewish Identity in the Modern World, Its Nature and dynamics. Uh, before I introduce Professor Meyer and say a few words about his lectures, uh, I thought it would be appropriate uh, to simply remind us all uh, of the nature of the series, the lecture series in which he's offering his presentation today. Uh, the Samuel and Althea Strom lectures have uh, been continuing without break since 1975, 1976, when the first lectures were offered. There have since been 14 uh, lectures, including those of Professor Meyer this past uh, month. Uh, a number of, of the lectures, as you may know, have already been published, uh, some very, very influentially. Uh, Professor Yosef Yerushalmi, who spoke in 1982-83, uh, published his lectures as Zahor. Uh, a book which has received wide distribution, has been translated into five languages. I suppose that has perhaps been the most successful. Uh, we're very happy uh, to announce that Robert Alter's lectures of 1986-87 have been published as The Invention of Hebrew Prose by the University of Washington Press, Modern Fiction and the Language of Realism. And that book has been reviewed very, very positively already, just having come out. Uh, a second lecture is already in press, uh, a new lecture is already impressed, that of William Deaver, uh, who spoke in 1985 on recent archaeological discoveries and biblical research. And that volume should be out very, very shortly, and I hope you'll be looking for it. Uh, we have now published, I believe, six of the lectures, and uh, they are now an impressive addition to the University of Washington's uh, publication record in Jewish studies, and we're very proud of them. Uh, it's just a few words. Uh, about the lectures which you're about to view, those of Michael Meyer. Uh, Michael Meyer himself has become a very important and internationally recognized scholar in the history of modern Judaism and of the Jews in modern times. Uh, one of his more important works is a volume that came out in the late 60s at Wayne State University Press called The Origins of the Modern Jew, uh, in which Professor Meyer describe the various intellectual and social tensions surrounding emancipation uh, in the late uh, 18th century, which contributed to the kind of strategies of self-identification that Jews would choose, particularly in Germany and following the German model throughout the modern world from the 19th into well into the 20th century. Uh, more recently, Professor Meyer has published a very important history of the movement of Reform Judaism called Response to Modernity, A History of the Reform Movement in Judaism. That was published by Oxford University Press just this past year and has received excellent uh, notices. Professor Meyer's lectures uh, for us this year have been entitled Jewish Identity in the Modern World, Its Nature and Dynamics. And here, Professor Meyer proposes to sum up for us a good 15 years of his research on the study of modern Jewry and the various systems of Judaism or ideolo ideologies of Jewish identity, uh, which the Jews in modern times have constructed for themselves by way of connecting their present, uh, which is in many cases very, very discontinuous with the past, uh, to some version of the past which they have chosen for themselves. Uh, the lectures, as you might have heard, have been very successful this year in particular. Uh, Professor Meyer spoke to uh, standing room only crowds uh, and I think all those who attended found that it was a truly magnificent uh, presentation. Uh, Professor Meyer speaks beautifully. Uh, 
uh, thinks deeply and uh, inspired all of us with the, the whole project of modern Jewish identity. And I hope those of you who are viewing his lectures uh, on video will enjoy them as much as we did who were privileged to attend. And without any further introduction, uh, let me invite you to enjoy uh, the 1988-89 Strom Lectures by Michael A. Meyer. Thank you very much. As a proper noun, enlightenment, capital E, refers to a particular intellectual movement in European history. And its Jewish equivalent became known by the Hebrew term Haskalah. However, I shall principally be concerned here with enlightenment in the generic sense as a force operating upon individual Jews and Jewish communities, engendering various responses and reflected in differing forms of Jewish identity. Thus it is the content and effect of enlightenment that matters here, not its representatives and organized forms. That content the content of enlightenment I take to be composed of two interrelated elements, reason and universalism. They are interrelated because reason implies a universal community of rational persons, and universalism in turn requires a common rational basis of discourse. Viewed thus broadly, the influence of enlightenment has been significant in Jewish history for more than two centuries. Enlightenment has been both an erosive force, undermining Jewish identity in its pre-modern form, and a constituent element of its modern varieties. On the one hand, it challenged the Jewish doctrine of supernatural revelation, and the Jews' religious or ethnic exclusivism. But on the other, it has become integral to the identities of nearly all modern Jews. Few Jews today still seek to exclude it. In order to understand the numerous ways in which enlightenment has affected modern Jewish identity, it will be useful, I think, to begin with a brief consideration of enlightenment in the pre-modern world, or of Jewish identity in the pre-modern world. Here it seems necessary to note immediately that rationalism and universalism were, of course, not entirely foreign to Jewish consciousness, even before modern times. There's a rich tradition of Jewish philosophy, after all, extending all the way back to Philo of Alexandria and down through the Middle Ages. Moreover, Jews never repudiated the universalism of the biblical prophets. But for various reasons, not the least of them exclusion and persecution, Jewish communities before the modern period had largely neglected this rational and universal heritage, stressing instead their own divinely ordained separation and superiority. Drawing upon the work of Jacob Katz, we can easily note the elements of exclusiveness that went into pre-modern Jewish identity as it was passed on through the generations. At its heart stood the firm belief that the Jews were God's chosen people, that they stood in a special relationship to God, that the persecution they suffered in exile was due to their own sinfulness, and that upon full repentance, they would be restored to a glorious existence in their own land. A Messiah from their stock would rule the nations of the earth. Jewish children were imbued with a belief in a sharp dichotomy between Jews and Gentiles. The former, the Jews, were deemed pure, children of the covenant, while the latter were called impure, and uncircumcised. 
One was not to regard them highly. One was not to imitate their actions, said Maimonides. When rage at their persecutors welled up within them, and when censors did not prevent them from writing freely, medieval Jews referred to Christians as idolaters, to their churches as houses of abomination, and to their savior as the hanged one. Seen in purely empirical terms, Judaism had been vanquished by its daughter religion, Christianity and Islam. But in the super-empirical perspective of faith, the Jews remained dearest to God. Physical segregation, sometimes welcomed by the Jews themselves, and badges imposed by Gentiles to mark them as Jews, reinforced these feelings of exclusiveness. So did Jewish law, which prohibited Jews from drinking Gentile wine and eating Gentile food, allowed them to take interest from non-Jews, but not from Jews, and valued strict observance of the Sabbath above saving the life of a Gentile on that day. There was no neutral ideological ground upon which Jew and Gentile could meet, no religion of humanity that they shared. Individuals were wholly the one or the other. Conversion was the only pathway out of the ghetto. Within those walls of that ghetto, clear models of Jewish identity were instilled in the home, in the school, in the community. There were no significant discontinuities, no occasions for severe crises of identity. The medieval Jewish community left little room for individuality. It imposed its norms sternly upon each child growing up and upon each adult. The German Hasidim of the 13th century, for example, were not averse to burning books that conveyed a conflicting message and to encouraging all members of the community to enforce the collective will upon each individual. Building fences inside fences, they regarded even non-Hasidic Judaism as threatening religious purity. The Gentile world lay yet further away beyond the outermost barrier. In some places, Jewish exclusivism receded during the late Middle Ages, but only slowly and incompletely. The more tolerant attitude of the late 13th century Provençal rabbi, Menachem Hameiri, who distinguished Muslims and Christians from idolaters, did not become dominant for Ashkenazi Jewry during his own time or for centuries thereafter. The new Hasidic movement, the one with which we are more familiar, born in 18th century Eastern Europe and still very much alive today, perpetuated the sharp dichotomy between the Jewish and the Gentile worlds. One of its most central texts gives that dichotomy metaphysical status when drawing upon the Jewish mystical tradition, it declares that since the souls of the nations of the world emanate from the realm of evil, they are inherently incapable of doing good for its own sake. In the 19th century, the leading Hungarian rabbi, Moses Sofer, cautioned his descendants to stay far from would-be modernizers and to read none of their writings. Rather, they should confine their studies to the traditional texts and commentaries while keeping their names unchanged their dress traditional, and their language that of the Jews. Still today, a tiny segment of the Jewish community rejects enlightenment as an anti-Jewish intrusion, and in the extreme instance, crosses the border from religious exclusivism, exclusivism into chauvinism. The vast majority of Jews, however, have incorporated enlightenment into their identities, making room for it alongside their Jewish legacy and even harmonizing the two. <laughs>
How did that change come about? It was in 17th century Holland that the first major conflict between community-enforced Jewish identity and modern individuality occurred. The Sephardi Jews of Amsterdam had adopted some of the rigid religious authoritarianism of the Iberian Catholic environment from which they had fled. Like the Inquisition, they possessed little tolerance for dissent. Yet their own identity was uncertain. Some had been Moranos, identifying secretly as Jews but possessing only imperfect knowledge of Judaism and unable to practice it fully. In Amsterdam, they asserted their Jewishness without dread of persecution, but out of an apparent lingering insecurity, they feared heresy as a force that could undermine their newly won redefinition as normative Jews. Orio Acosta had himself been a Murano in Portugal before he arrived in Amsterdam in the second decade of the 17th century. But Oriol Acosta's return to Judaism was troubled from the start. A startlingly independent personality whose Jewish identity was not transmitted naturally in childhood he came to active Jewish identification out of a growing conviction that Judaism was the true faith. His continued adherence to it depended upon whether that conviction could be sustained. Mistakenly, he had come to believe that Judaism was simply the faith of the Hebrew Bible. Once he discovered that biblical laws and tenets had been considerably altered and expanded by the rabbis, he found himself at odds with Amsterdam Jewry when he persistently rejected rabbinic Judaism in belief and in practice, they excommunicated him. Unable to find a way of living both within the Jewish community and in harmony with his conscience, he finally committed suicide. Acosta is of particular interest for the study of Jewish identity. He was a man with little tolerance for contradiction. His inner need for consistency drove him first from the New Testament to the Old, and finally to a rejection of all revelation in favor of natural law alone. His last choice was for the coherence provided by untrammeled reason as the sole guide in life. Baruch Spinoza, who lived just after Acosta in Amsterdam, followed a similar path. For him as well, Jewish identity gave way before a larger attachment to the community of all rational persons, even though that community as yet had no basis in social reality. Spinoza, too was placed under the ban. Neither Acosta nor Spinoza left Judaism for another faith community. To their contemporaries, they were heretics, men whose convictions pushed them out of a Judaism that could not tolerate their deviation. Yet paradoxically, Acosta, and especially Spinoza, became models of Jewish identity for later Jewish intellectuals. It was precisely their nonconformity that appealed to those Jews of later generations who began to define their own Jewishness in terms of marginality and the insights that marginality offered. Late in life, Freud referred to himself as an old Jew, but an infidel one. The philosopher Walter Kaufman called his religion the faith of a heretic. And the Marxist Jewish intellectual, 
Isaac Deutscher, chose to identify with a whole chain of Jewish heretical tradition that ran from Elisha ben Abuya, the heretic rabbi of the second century, down through Spinoza, Heine, and Marx, to Rosa Luxemburg, Trotsky, and Freud. But Acosta and Spinoza in their day remained socially isolated. They stood alone outside the Jewish consensus. Not until a century later did a movement that enjoyed growing support begin within Jewish communities to broaden identifications, extending them beyond the boundaries of Judaism while still remaining Jews. It was then the European Enlightenment, this time with a capital E, of the 18th century that initiated the process of broadly undermining this Jewish exclusiveness of the Middle Ages. Despite the ambivalent of Enlightenment thinkers toward the Jews and their all but unanimous condemnation of Judaism as a religion, the universal rational categories in which the men of the Enlightenment thought drove them to include Jews within the fellowship of humanity. Natural religion, the religion of reason, was a faith underlying both Judaism and Christianity. As the environment became less hostile, and as Jews and Christians came into closer social contact, those Jews most exposed to Gentiles and their ways began to identify themselves not only as Jews, but also as German or French, Europeans, or simply enlightened human beings. Jewish identity then contracted to make room for new elements absorbed from the outside world. The result was widening intergenerational and intra-community conflict. No longer was there a clear consensus. No longer was the transition from generation to generation an easy one. And no longer was it simply a matter of an occasional heretic. Rather, for increasing numbers of Jews then coming of age, Jewish identity ceased to be a, a natural, unself-conscious framework for their lives. As enlightenment penetrated one class of Jews after the other, one community after another, Jewish identity became problematic. Which elements of the self now remain Jewish? Was one principally a Jew and secondarily a European, or was it vice versa? Identity crisis became a recurrent feature in the generational transmission of Jewishness. Wherever enlightenment penetrated, it brought self-consciousness, and especially for intellectuals, the need to achieve self-definition. The new identifications called into question some of the old ones. For Moses Mendelssohn, the 18th century German philosopher, who managed to live both as a traditional Jew and as a man of the European Enlightenment, the latter component of his identity sometimes jostled the former. As a rationalist, for example, he could not believe, as many of his fellow Jews did believe, that demons attacked Jewish corpses before burial. As a European, he could find no value in traditional Jewish dress. And as a Germanophile, he found the Yiddish language to be a corrupting influence. But mostly, he solved the problem of potential conflict by separating and narrowing his Jewish identity while leaving it basically intact. His Jewishness became a matter of private conscience. Unlike the Sephardi authorities of Amsterdam, he would not impose his own convictions on anyone else. Neither church nor state, he believed, should act coercively in matters of religion. 
Personally, he could live at peace in two spheres, for Judaism and reason. Judaism and European culture, as he understood them, did not conflict. His religion, as he interpreted it, possessed no super-rational dogmas, and it was fully tolerant of divergent faith communities. What set the Jews apart and constituted their special identity was for Mendelssohn preeminently the law that God had revealed to them at Sinai. It governed their actions, but not their thoughts. Yet although unlike the law, rational religion was not for Jews alone, it was in Mendelssohn's view a particular legacy of Judaism to have propagated it, and its continued advocacy constituted a Jewish vocation. Jews were chosen by providence, Mendelssohn said, to call wholesome and unadulterated ideas of God and God's attributes continually to the attention of the rest of humanity. Mendelssohn thus set forth an idea which would be used by many others after him, the idea of the mission of Israel. Judaism, then, was the enlightened religion par excellence. To be a Jew was not to preserve the fragments of an outworn identity, hopelessly at odds with enlightenment. Just the opposite was true. Rational religion, Mendelssohn argued, was the legacy of Judaism, not yet fully absorbed by non-Jews. Jewish identity thus became focused outward. One was a Jew because one had a mission to the non-Jew, a mission that not only was in harmony with modernity, but could help to shape it. Mendelssohn and those that followed him define Jewish identity primarily in religious terms. To be a Jew now came to mean belonging to a religious denomination, more or less like the Christian ones. Jewish identity was expressed in terms of avowing certain beliefs and practicing certain rituals. The unit of Jewish community, the Jewish of unit, unit of Jewish continuity was the community of faith. For the modern Orthodox, the Jewish religion was eternal and hence could easily serve as the vehicle of Jewish identity from generation to generation. But religious reformers faced a more difficult situation when they thinned the strand of Jewish ethnicity. For the Jewish religion as the reformers conceived it, had changed in the past and would continue to change. Aside from its universalist credo of ethical monotheism, liberal Judaism offered no permanent mooring to which Jewish identity could be made fast. Its proponents were forced to understand Jewishness in its particularity as ever developing along with the evolution of the Jewish religion. Moses Mendelssohn, served most fully as an identity model for modern Jewish orthodoxy. Like Mendelssohn, Samson Raphael Hirsch, the progenitor of neo-orthodoxy in what we in the United States call modern orthodoxy, was a man of European culture along with broader identifications. For generations of modern orthodox Jews in Germany and elsewhere, Hirsch's writing successfully neutralized the dangers inherent in enlightenment by arguing that Jewish religion and contemporary culture could exist compartmentally, side by side. It was simply necessary to insist on the primacy of revelation at every point of possible theological conflict. Like Mendelssohn, Hirsch remained observant of the law and preached to the Jews their mission of bringing religious truth to the Gentiles. But other modern religious Jews deviated from orthodoxy and thereby withdrew from Mendelssohn's shadow. For them, critical historical thought eroded faith, both in the written and the oral law of Judaism. Conservative spirits 
like Zacharias Frankel, the progenitor of what became conservative Judaism in the United States, were able to harmonize historical criticism with revelation by historicizing the rabbinic literature while leaving the written Torah untouched as the directly revealed word of God. As far as we know, cognitive dissonance never disturbed Frankel's apparently tranquil soul. He was able to see himself and his generation as a link in the chain of halachic development. Abraham Geiger, the religious reformer and progenitor of Reform Judaism in this country, presents a sharply contrasting picture, one of severe identity crisis. Emerging from an orthodox home into a German university setting that challenged the traditions which had nurtured him, Geiger long and painfully struggled to achieve a Jewish identity into which he could incorporate commitment to the methods and findings of historical science. Scholarship demanded critical distance, looking at Judaism from the outside. But being a Jew, and in his case a rabbi, required inner identification with the totality of the Jewish experience. Eventually, Geiger was able to integrate both roles into his life and to help to create a form of Judaism in which faith did not set bounds to science. For other Jews, especially after Geiger's time, the religious component of Jewish identity gave way entirely before the scientific ideals of scholarship. Learning, which had been a Jewish value when applied in a traditional manner to religious texts, became an independent characteristic of Jewish identity. Studying remained a form of Jewish expression, even when the method of study was critical and the purpose to test one's acumen or to write a work of scholarship rather than to discern God's will. And finally, learning became Jewish regardless of its content. For many Jews, the serious study of any worthy subject became a way of being Jewish. But intellectual challengers were not the only ones that assailed Jewish identity. An increasing number of the young felt estranged from their fellow Jews, no less than they felt alienated from Jewish tradition. Enlightenment not only made their ancestors' beliefs and practices unacceptable to many of them, it distanced them from parents and relatives and reduced their sense of oneness with the Jewish people as a whole, most of whom as yet remained unenlightened. In the writings of enlightened German Jews around the turn of the 19th century, there are at least three instances in which the author undertakes an elaborate classification of the Jews of his time according to degrees of enlightenment. Each author identifies himself with a small group that he regards as truly enlightened. The remaining Jews, clinging to superstitions or in extreme reaction, forsaking Judaism for libertinism, are not objects of identification. The range of Jewish social identity narrows as growing differences among Jews make full identification possible only with a smaller group within the Jewish community. For the enlightened Jews, it is their fellow enlightened. For the traditionalists, it is those who have stood fast with them in imposing the intrusion of alien values. This fragmentation required the use of new designations. Enlightened Jews who had emancipated themselves from rabbinic law and customs, reducing the textual basis for their identity to the Bible, chose to call themselves by such names as Mosaic instead of Jewish. A broad spectrum of Jews, including the modern Orthodox, found they did not want to call themselves Jews because that term was not only used contemptuously by Gentiles, but it was associated with their exclusiveness in the pre-modern period. They chose 
Israelite or Hebrew. Instead, terms that were used in the title of both Reform and Orthodox Jewish newspapers in various countries. To separate themselves from reformers, traditional Jews also required a more specific and positive term than orthodoxy. They chose the term Torah true, by which they meant loyalty to the full, twofold revelation of the written and the oral law. Aside from the home, it was the school in which the child made the identifications that were shaped into personal identity. Not surprisingly, education was from the beginning a principal concern of the maskilim, the Jewish enlighteners. In altering the curriculum of the Jewish school to embrace secular as well as Jewish studies, they inculcated values that lay outside of Judaism. In giving the students teachers who stood with one foot in the Jewish community and the other in the non-Jewish world, these educators displayed personal models very different from those presented by the conventional teacher of small children, the traditional Malamed. The combination of traditional home and modern schooling generated identity conflicts that could not easily be resolved. Only after Jewish homes, too, began to integrate non-Jewish culture did this gap between parents and children characterizing the first generation of enlightenment cease to be so severe. Perhaps the most insidious value that European culture set against Jewish tradition was not scientific truth, but beauty. Mendelssohn himself had developed an interest in aesthetics. His successors carried it further. Studying the Bible, for example, as a work of extraordinary literary merit, rather than simply as a religious text, but although an appreciation for beauty, especially in relation to a religious purpose, was not entirely absent from any period of Jewish history, the veneration of beauty was Greek, not Hebrew. As enlightenment brought Jews to aesthetic awareness, they often saw themselves compelled to choose between Hellenism and the strict moralism of Jewish tradition. The poet Heinrich Heine felt this conflict intensely and for most of his life chose to emulate the handsome young men of Greece rather than the stern patriarchs of ancient Israel. Later generations of Jews in Eastern Europe were similarly attracted by that alien ideal of beauty. The Hebrew poet Chaim Nachman Bialik described the fatal allure of natural beauty to the yeshiva student. The poet Shaul Chernochovsky imagined himself venerating the statue of Apollo, the Greek god of, of handsome masculinity. Even if Jewish secular poets and artists could, like Jewish rationalists, find some precedent for their artistic enterprise in the Jewish past, it was far more difficult for them to overcome the conflict with a tradition that was deeply suspect of art for its own sake and to absorb new aesthetic elements into Jewish identity. In Russia, the Haskalah was more focused inward than its German predecessor. Rather than defining Jewish ne Jewishness narrowly in religious terms to make room for other identifications, it sought to bring the outside world inside an expanded Jewish sphere. But that enlarged Jewish sphere would look very different. In one of the Russian Haskalah's earliest programmatic statements, called to Udabi Yisrael, a mission in Israel, Isaac Baer Levinson urged a transformation whereby Jewish schools would teach the sciences and the languages of the lands in which Jews live, along with Hebrew presented according to grammatical rules. Only the few 
who required professional expertise as rabbis would bother to study Talmud. The new Jew, educated in this manner, Levinson showed, would not represent a sharp break with the past, but only embody traditions that were well precedented, especially among the Sephardim. The medieval philosophers, Saadia and Maimonides, for example, were models of the rationalism that Levinson was propagating. Thus, enlightenment was not a departure from Judaism, he could argue, but merely the substitution of presently dominated values for others drawn from its past. In retaining attachment to Hebrew, moreover, the more moderate of the East European Muskilim sought to preserve an ethnic bond that rapidly disintegrated in the West. Levinson and later writers were fully cognizant of its role in uniting Jews everywhere. Unlike the Jewish religious reformers in Germany, they left worship services in Hebrew. They also differed in not copying Christian practices, at least in part because the Russian Orthodox Church, unlike the Protestants in Germany, did not present an attractive model of religious modernization. It was only the excessive rigor with which Jewish law was applied and the narrowness of a religious leadership that denounced all secular learning that the Russian Moskilim excoriated with bitter sarcasm. Their ideal was dat im daat, religion together with secular knowledge, both of them within the Jewish orbit. Yet in Eastern Europe as well, enlightenment wrought havoc. For secular knowledge not only expanded intellectual horizons, it presented new perspectives from which the beliefs that one held and the customs that one practiced as a Jew began to look irrational or ugly. The result was a step-by-step -step process in which the sancta of Judaism were desacralized and ultimately rejected. The role model for the Jewish boy had been the Talmud Chacham, the scholar of sacred texts. For the girl, the Eshet Chayil, the faithful wife and mother. Enlightenment introduced new models. For men, especially the physician, later also the industrialist. For those women on the furthest edges of enlightenment, the pharmacist position that some women were able to attain, or even the operetta diva. Talmud study was not merely displaced in the curriculum, it became an object of derision, along with the manner in which it was taught. The rationalistic scalpel at first cut away only superstitions, belief in demons, the use of amulets. But once the incision was made, there was no holding back the knife rabbinic legends, then rabbinic laws, and finally biblical laws were stripped away one by one. As traditional belief waned, the practices which it sanctioned fell into neglect. Once the Haskalah became more radical, its adherents not only gave up the garments which marked them as Jews, but also the phylacteries, the tefillin, strict observance of the Sabbath, and finally, the dietary laws, kashrut. The spread of religious negligence seems to have progressed more rapidly among men than women. The latter, the women, preserving traditions within the pervasively Jewish atmosphere of the home in which they spent the larger portion of their daily lives. As men visited the synagogue more rarely, it ceased to serve them as a source for news about the larger outer world outside the Jewish community. In place of the conversation on secular topics, shmus, conducted there on weekdays and filtered through Jewish concerns, non-Jewish newspapers became the purveyors of information, bringing their own perspective to contemporary events. Perhaps the greatest weakness of the Russian Haskalah was its inherent instability. For many Moskilim, it was not a destination, but only a station on a continuing odyssey. 
It undermined the old way of life without providing a satisfactory new one. Yudlamid Gordon, one of the most prominent of the Russian Moskilin, came to the sad recognition that the Haskalah was the ideology of a single generation. The children of the Moskilin went on to leave the Jewish heritage altogether. No longer believers, substituting Russian language for Hebrew, their Jewish identity became vestigial. In her memoirs, Pauline Wengerov well expressed the transitional character of the middle generations by citing premonitions that her mother used to express. Her mother used to say, two things I can say for sure. I and my generation will certainly live and die as Jews. Our grandchildren will surely not live and die as Jews. Only what our children will become, that I cannot guess. What happened to that third generation, which went beyond the Haskalah's objective of enlightenment within the Jewish sphere? Those Russian and Polish Jews most concerned for their careers often converted to Christianity, as their similarly motivated co-religionists had begun to do earlier in the West. Some were drawn to alien ideologies. They became positivists, substituting a universal, anti-metaphysical, and practically oriented philosophy for both religion and literary culture. Or they turned to socialism, in which they found a cause demanding the same commitment that traditional Judaism had imposed upon pre-modern generations. The most extreme among Jewish socialists regarded socialism as an identity that could not be harmonized with Judaism. Either one identified with the Jewish people and its religion, or with the international proletariat and its rejection of all religion as simply a veil masking the privileged status of the wealth. Jewish socialists of this kind rejected their Jewish origins or regarded them as insignificant. Some were even willing to accept the negative stereotypes of Jews propagated by their fellow socialists. Rosa Luxemburg neither identified as a Jew nor displayed any particular concern for the persecution suffered by fellow Jews. She was a consistent and uncompromising internationalist. Leon Trotsky, too, denied any Jewish loyalty, though he at least recognized that Jews were especially vulnerable to their enemies. Perhaps the most extreme in rejecting Jewish identity were the Jewish Narodniki, Jews who romantically associated themselves with the cause of the Russian country masses. Unlike the Jewish Marxists, they did not flee their particular Jewish identity for a universal one that embraced and superseded all others. No, they played at being what they patently were not, intimates of the simple Russian Orthodox peasants. Sometimes they were shocked to discover that although they themselves had forsworn their Jewish identity, the peasants they, they thought to serve nonetheless regarded them and regarded them negatively as Jews nonetheless. In the United States, too, the universalism and rationalism that comprise enlightenment drew Jews to the periphery of Jewish identity and some of them beyond it. During the latter part of the 19th century, the American reform movement entered its so-called classical phase. Ritual observance in reform synagogues and homes diminished in accordance with a conviction that advanced religion was based on ethics, not symbolic acts. Particularizing rituals which tended to reinforce Jewish identity, such as blowing the ram's horn on the new year, building booths on the field's feast of tabernacles, and observing dietary laws, were all but abandoned. To be a Jew in the sense of classical reform Judaism meant to be an adherent of ethical monotheism, 
a faith that derived from the Hebrew prophets, but was not meant for Jews alone. Jewish identity was being part of a community that cherished commitment to the universalistic ideal of a single God worshipped by a united humanity. One remained a Jew to propagate that ideal. But was a particular identity indeed necessary to advance this universal goal? Felix Adler, the son of a reform rabbi, thought not. In 1876, Adler founded the New York Society for Ethical Culture, which soon attracted hundreds of peripheral Jews to its ranks. Adler simply followed the impetus of enlightenment to what he regarded as its logical conclusion. His commitment to reason drew him to a Kantianism that left no room for a personal God but only for an impersonal moral power. His universalism led him to criticize Reform Judaism's adherence to the mission of Israel as a form of chauvinism, no better than the ancient chosen people concept. To be sure, Adler did not virulently reject his Jewish identity. He was proud of his ancestry, but its personal meaning was limited to origins. Like Jewish socialists in Europe, he identified with humanity in general, not with the Jews in particular. In the present, Judaism was a vestige, not an active force. It was destined to lose its distinctiveness within the sea of humanity. The future, he believed, lay in an eclectic religion beyond all religious particularisms, those of Christianity and other faiths, no less than those of Judaism. And there was no compelling reason to postpone that future. Mixed marriages, like those of his own children, were a step in the right direction. Enlightenment thus manifested itself as a force that could draw Jews further and further away from Jewish identity across the territory where one was a Jew and the same time something else as well, European, German, Kantian socialist, to the border where Jewish identity became vestigial or disappeared entirely. Yet in the border regions, countervailing forces arose that sometimes reversed the trajectory. In the succeeding lectures, we shall analyze the two most important such forces, anti-Semitism and Jewish nationalism. But often, the Jewish religion also played a large role in such processes of reorientation. During the last two generations, for example, the American reform movement has sought to recapture religious traditions that it had earlier regarded as primitive or inappropriate in the West. At least in part, this counterthrust in reform Judaism has been propelled by an awareness that when enlightenment is fully internalized, it leaves so little room for the specifically Jewish that the residue is insufficient for generational transmission. Similarly, some individual Jews who seem furthest removed from Jewishness have attached themselves to religious orthodoxy, occasionally turning their backs on enlightenment with a vengeance. These Baalei Teshuvah, or repentance, have become an ever more common phenomenon, both in Israel and the United States. Not always, however, is return from the border regions either easy or complete. But it is, I suggest, an ongoing force that persistently draws Jews to look beyond their Jewishness even as they seek to absorb it 
its rationalism, its universalism, alongside of or within their particular identity as Jews. What happens to Jewish identity when that larger world presents the Jew not with acceptance, but rejection in the form of anti-Semitism, that is the subject of the second lecture.